Property X Factor is brought to you in association with Martin Lynch & Sons, the world's favourite ham store. And the Radio Society of Great Britain is proud to sponsor TX Factor. And welcome to TX Factor. Now, I've just got to find Mike. Uh, G1 IAR, G1 IAR. This is G0 FGX. Do you copy? G0 FGX, G1 IAR. Yes, I do copy. And where are you, Bob? I'm looking for you. It's freezing cold up here. Please come in. It's all right. I'm just here. Uh, I was only just over there. And we were doing a radio link over a very short distance. But in this episode of TX Factor, we're going to talk about some bigger links. Yeah, we're going to look at how you link two repeaters that are 13 miles apart without even going anywhere near the internet. And also why that's very important if you want to use those repeaters for emergency communication. And to find out what else is in this 25th edition, bumper edition of TX Factor, here's Nick. Well, Bob, we have weather notifications from WeatherCrest, how to eliminate code plugs with R-Finder. We learn about WolfWave from Soda Beams and have a good chat about the history of Elecraft and their latest rig with Eric. Plus our 25th edition prize bundle for grabs in our free-to-enter draw. And then it's back out into the elements to discover how two UK city councils are planning their communication strategy for when and if the internet goes down. But first, it's Mike talking about the weather again. So us radio hams are a big fan of knowing what the propagation is going to be like and whether it's going to be any good. But I know that a lot of us now are really getting into looking at what's the weather going to do. And you've got some brand new software which yeah. shows up a lot of useful information. Absolutely, because it can have so many impacts on amateur radio. Um, really important to know whether there's lightning nearby, for example, because that lightning can have quite extreme effects on the mast, particularly. You need to make sure you know when to unplug your equipment, because that's really expensive equipment and quite valuable. It's a um, key issue, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So what um, our WQ radar does is this allows you to track rainfall across the UK, but also you can set yourself up to get lightning alerts. So when a thunderstorm comes within 30 miles of your location, you'll get a, a little email to tell you that um, your masts might be in danger and that um, you need to, you need rush to take back precautions. Home. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, <laughs> definitely. So you can use the software to find out like what's happening for the day's weather, what you might have planned to do, go outdoors, stay indoors, things like that. Absolutely, you can get it on your mobile. If you're going out for a day out, you can change your location, change the lightning alerts so that you'll get them wherever you are. We're all used to watching the national weather forecast on the TV, but one thing that us radio hams like doing is almost being our own little weatherman too, and you can do that with your software, right? Definitely, and it's such a fun game to play as well. There's so much going on. Using WQ Radar, you can, as I said, keep up to date with the rain. There's so many other things you can look at, so you can get weather observations across the UK and worldwide as well, so you can keep an eye on whatever the weather is doing. Another useful thing to look at is wind gusts, because obviously that can be quite important for the masts as well, quite tall structures so no when gusty winds are coming and you can take your mask down or so unlike the national weather forecast that we're all watching on the TV using your software you could pretty much find out exactly what's going on in your back garden exactly and keep an eye on the weather near you okay and is it easy to download install and run yeah so it's um it's a website you just get a username and a login password and you can have it on your phone your tablet your pc it goes anywhere all devices all right thanks very much for the info i think i'm going to start practicing to be my own <laughs> weatherman now thank you mike Hey, this is great. I found another Bob to talk to, but this Bob's all the way from the USA, W2CYK. And Bob, us hams, we love DMR. This is something that people are into in quite a big way in this country. But when you get that new DMR radio, you've got to worry about code plugs. Code plug? Uh, so whereabouts in the USA are you from, Bob? From Long Island, New York. So you're here showing off uh, your products from a company called R-Finder. Tell us about that. Yeah, R-Finder is uh, the worldwide repeated directory. We started it about 14 years ago. And we're partners with RSGB as well as a variety of other radio societies around the world like RAC, 
ARRL, all the Western Europeans, U URE, REP, REF, even Latvia. I mean, we're, we're, uh, we're really all over the place as uh, partners with the local radio societies. So how do we use this then, Bob? Well, it helps you program your, your, uh, your radios. So for instance, we're fully integrated with RT Systems and Chirp. In RT Systems, you can search around a point, you can search along a route, and actually like blast your radio with uh, channels that you need for your trip in just a matter of moments. It's really quite quick. Ah, that's fantastic. So it saves you looking it all up. The big problem with analog repeaters is, of course, is the CTSS and all the access. Yeah, well, we keep track of all that stuff. It's all in the database. Mm. So, you know, as you guys would say, it's brilliant, right? Yeah, we would say brilliant, absolutely. Yeah. I understand you've been practicing your Bringlish since you've been here. I'll try not to be too posh. Okay. <laughs> yeah, well, you've come to the right program if you don't want posh. <laughs> so when we get to do DMR, it's a whole different ball game again, isn't it? Because you get that new radio, you get it out of the box, and it's, oh, it doesn't do anything yet. I've got to put a code plug into it. Yeah, so it's very difficult. And actually, it's one of the biggest challenges that hams have is dealing with the code plugs. And if I program it from my area and I go somewhere else, I'm carrying a brick. Um, this radio works anywhere on Earth. We have one code plug called Earth. It just works. So, um, for instance, I landed in uh, Madrid a couple of weeks ago. I've been in Europe for a few weeks, and uh, it just worked. When I landed in Madrid, I brought up the repeaters around Madrid. I drove to Avila, Spain. It worked all the way up to Avila, all the way back to Madrid. And then I flew to Tel Aviv. I had a variety of meetings in Israel and it worked as soon as I got off the plane, I brought up a machine about 15 miles from the, from the airport and keyed it right up and I was, uh, I was on uh, Worldwide English immediately. Is this your own proprietary radio then, Bob? I'm the one that uh, designed this one. This is actually our fourth generation. Uh, the previous ones were designed by a company in, uh, in China that we uh, repurposed. We re modified the ROM and put our software on it and made it so that it was usable. But this one is actually, it's the B1, Bob 1. Yeah. This one actually one is, is of my design. So I'm guessing then you've got to put a SIM card into it so that it can pick up the 4G and get all that information? Or you can use Wi-Fi, and in fact, you can preload on Wi-Fi, preload your continent worth of data, all of your, uh, all of your DMR contacts. It's unlimited. I mean, you know, some radios only hold 100,000 contacts. This is really unlimited. You have, 64 gigs of memory to store your contacts in, and it takes about a minute and a half to, to load the current 140,000 contacts on DMR into this thing. Uh, on an average radio, it takes about 20 minutes on a cable, so it's really quite amazing. You can update your contacts at will, pretty much, on the fly. How did it know, then, where you are, Bob? When you got off that plane in Tel Aviv, how did it know to go, right, this is what I need to do? So it's a full-blown Android phone. So if I hit the home button like I would any other Android and press the, uh, the button, you can see I have my full contact list. Nobody call my friends, okay? Um, and um, it, it does everything that an Android would, you know, in terms of uh, being able to load apps and things like that. But because it's an Android, some people happen to like uh, some of these network radio apps like Zello and TeamSpeak and things like that. We have a second PTT button for use with those apps. We have a PTT button for RF and a PTT button for, uh, for network radio. So you can use this as a network radio for your favorite apps. Uh, you can use it as uh, FM, DMR. It does both FM wide and narrow band. So it's quite nice. That's fantastic. So you don't need to have a separate mobile phone and a separate radio. You've got your handy and your mobile all in one box. That's correct. In fact, uh, uh, I carried an M1 for two years. I think I have one somewhere over here. This was our uh, generation two. I carried one of these for two years uh, on my side. And uh, the K1, this was generation three. And I carried one of these for about a year. And then now uh, this is my new uh, wonderful device. And it's quite fun. I mean, being able to travel around the world and be able to use your radio without even thinking about it. Just looking at the screen and saying, oh, there's a machine, click it and connect to it. And that's that. The big question, Bob, that everyone who's watching this is going to be asking is, where can I get one? Um, we've gotten uh, commitments from both Moonraker and from Martin Lynch that they'll be carrying these radios here in, in the UK. Uh, and we've got some other uh, uh, resellers around Europe. Um, uh, we have one up in Belgium, Maze Communications. They'll be carrying it. 
uh, Gallicom up in Spain. We'll be carrying them also. You can order them online also from rfinder.shop. Thanks, Bob, for showing us this radio because I've never seen anything quite like this before. Thank you. Uh, and my mom, my mom actually says that I finally did something right. So you know, it's actually kind of, kind of nice. You know, um, and I appreciate that. You know, that you like it. It's really, uh, it's been, really been a great, great adventure making this. Now that is the best sales pitch I've ever heard. So this is the sales pitch from Bob. Buy his radio and make his mum proud of it. Make his mum proud. What's better than that? So, I've had a great time, by the way, in, in England. You guys are hilarious. <laughs> hilarious. And I really have a great time every time I come. So. Bob, we think you're great too, but just a mummy's boy at heart. And we'll be highlighting yet another innovative device from the UK's very own Soda Beams. And that's after this. Martin Lynch & Sons are pleased to announce the exciting new Sun SDR2 Pro DX from Expert Electronics. With 100 watts on HF, 50 on 6 and 8 watts on 2 meters, it's a very compact and versatile transceiver. There's a separate connector for active cooling and an improved supply system, meaning it's perfectly suitable for DX Expeditions. And it's available now for only $2,099.95. For more information on this exciting full SDR and its full spec, see the website. Martin Lynch & Sons are the largest retailer of Yesu, Icom and Kenwood in the UK, with approved workshops on site. Our dedication to all things ham radio has earned us an enviable reputation for the number one supplier of amateur radio products throughout the world. Our 6,000 square foot superstore is located only a few miles from London's Heathrow Airport in Staines. So, if you're looking for absolutely anything ham radio related, then give Martin Lynch a call or see their website. Martin Lynch & Sons, the world's number one ham store. So I've come across one of the traders I always love speaking to and I was attracted once again by lots of noise and hiss and whooshes and bangs from his stand. Richard from Soda Beams, the last time we spoke was with the Whisper Light Box. That's right, Which yes. was a revelation for me personally yes. in terms of looking at my HF antenna system at home. Okay. Now, you're always busy doing new things every well, year. I really admire you for that. Now, your new product is Wolfwave. That's right. Great name. <laughs> well, thank what you. does it do? Okay, well, Wolfwave is a, an audio processor. So basically it takes the audio in from your radio and any radio, so from a top-end SDR right down to a QCX radio kit that you've built yourself, and it processes it to provide you with all sorts of interesting additional facilities. So it's fantastically sharp bandpass filtering that you can use on both CW and SSB. It's got noise reduction. It's even got age-related hearing correction. Wow. So you enter in your sex and your age, and it automatically adjusts for the median hearing loss of someone of your age. It's a product that we've, uh, we've developed over about 18 months work's gone into it so far, and it's USB upgradable. So as we've had new facilities, all the users get the new facilities sort of free of charge. So we've recently added a, a really neat facility for CW operators, which is called binaural. So that means that the different tone frequencies appear to come from different directions. So we use a, a model of the human head to allow the tones to come from different directions. So it provides you with a whole new way of selectivity on the bands. It makes the bands sound really interesting and exciting because as you tune across, the signals appear to move from left to right or right okay. to left. So it's really quite interesting. So it's like massive noise reduction as yeah, well. There's a noise reduction as well, yeah. And I'd love to see it in action. So go on, prove it. Okay, fine. So here we're decoding a signal, and if you're listening to it at the moment, it sounds like a perfect signal, doesn't it? Happy with that? Yep, okay, but it's not a perfect signal because we're actually removing all the noise from that signal, and it sounds as though it's perfect. But let's listen to the signal that's actually coming in. That's wow. where the unit bypassed, so now this, the signal that's coming in is actually pretty noisy. You can see it's still decoding it, and if we put the unit in, it's perfect. Okay. So that's, a, that's called a CW regenerator, so it's actually regenerating. Uh, so you, as you say, you can see it scrolling onto the screen. Uh, you've also got a nice little spectrum display on the right-hand side of the screen, so you can zoom in on the, just the signal that you want to decode. And this is, this is decoding 32 words per minute now. That's right. So. And it's a pretty noisy signal. There's the signal where, without the uh, noise reduction provided by the wolf. Oil. And the text is still scrolling across oh, yes. the screen, yes. even with all that noise yes, going Yes, indeed. On. And I love the fact that you've got software built into it that you can kind of almost uh, mock up who the user is. 
settings in there that you enter in your, your age and, yes, and stuff like that. Loss. So that's, yes. kind of, that's yeah. a nice touch. That's been really popular. And what we found is a lot of SSB users really like that facility. Because what you tends to happen is as you get older, you don't notice that you're losing your hearing, particularly at the upper end of the uh, frequency oh. range. <laughs> Uh, and uh, with this, when you put it, when you, when you return that hearing to what it should have been when you were 18, remember those days, yeah. uh, it actually makes an amazing difference in terms of the readability of, of, uh, of SSB signals. And I signals. guess as well, like if you're going to use it for Morse, um, for somebody who's struggling to actually hear what they're doing, they might even go, oh, I can't be bothered with this now, it's, it's too much like hard work. With something like this, all of a sudden you've game changed the whole thing. It can be, and yes. And they're going to go, I can people, actually hear what I'm doing now. Yes, I'm going to some, play more For some again. people that has been the case, yes. Which has been really quite nice for us to, to find that we've brought radio back to some people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And all the, all the filtering's done by, I guess, DSP inside the box. Yes, that's right. We use a very powerful processor. It's an ARM M7, uh, which is the most powerful of their low current consumption processors. As we produce new firmware for this particular uh, product, uh, the users can upgrade it. So uh, all the upgrades are free. So since we launched it, we've had two or three upgrades, which added new facilities, added functionality. We're very much driven by the users. So uh, yeah. we, have a, we have a Facebook group and users say, wouldn't it be great if Wolfwave could do this or that? And we've taken a lot of those ideas and incorporated them. So as the new firmware gets, gets put onto the system, they get those new facilities. And that is the ultimate customer satisfaction because you get so. feedback immediately from your customers. Yes. You put it in place, everybody's happy. We hope so, yes. Superb, fantastic, Richard. All right, okay. well, great to see you. Great to see the Wolf Wave. Good luck with that. And Thank you. next year, you're going to come up with another gizmo, I'm sure of it. There's more in the, in, the, in the pipeline, yes. Go forth and solder. Thank you very much. There is one kind of radio that has what I would call a real fan following in the UK, and I know around the world, and that's Ellicraft. And Mr. Ellicraft himself, Eric WA6HHQ, is with us. Very briefly, tell us a bit of history on your range of radios. Well, back in 1999, Wayne Burdick and I, um, and actually a little bit earlier than that, but in terms of designing what um, became the K2, our first radio, um, we shipped our first product January of 1999, so we're the 21st year of operation now. And uh, we designed that one again, literally outside of Silicon Valley in our basements while we were working at other companies. I had a small high-tech company I was running, and uh, Wayne was working as a design engineer for a think tank over in Palo Alto called uh, Interval Corporation by, by Paul Allen. He had Microsoft had a research group there. And uh, we started designing the K2, so it was a fun project, and it turned into a business. I never expected it to turn out that way. And it's become a heck of a business. Sure did. We, uh, we found once we did the initial design and started prototyping it, that we could push the performance up and actually became a top performing radio as a kit. So that was a big, big change for us. So we grew the company uh, from that point uh, from, and went full time on it in, uh, in 1999 and basically uh, went through the K2. We had some smaller radios, the KX1, the K1. These were QRP radios at the time. The K2 eventually became a 100 watt radio. And again, high performance radio in that area. So it was used for de-expeditions, all sorts of things like that. And then uh, we started doing a whole range of accessories for those radios, auto tuners and so on. And then in 2007, we introduced the K3, which of course exploded the company. We, we grew very rapidly there. Uh, the K3 again was top performing, the next step up in, in terms of uh, ham radio performance and became sort of the standard for de-expeditions and also, of course, home stations to work those D-Expeditions and, and work DX and so on. It's a lot of fun, both a kit and a built radio. That's an important point then, back to the original spirit of amateur radio, radios that you can put together yourself and people say, yeah, you can't do that yeah. anymore. Well, actually, the K2 is a, like a Heath kit. You could actually solder it all together. To some extent, that was something that allowed us to be unique in the market because there weren't any ham radio kits at that, both 100, you know, 160 through 10 meter coverage that you could build 100% yourself by soldering together. And that allowed us also, because we didn't have a big manufacturing operation, to come into market quickly with that and build a company. But as we did the K3, here we had more of a modular radio because you, know, you have surface mount components. It's really not effective to do it as a, a large surface mount kit. The cost to actually kit all those little parts and put them in special bags would cost more than doing it in an automated production environment. Um, and by the way, we build everything in California. So um, that was done for, all the soldering is done by a turnkey manufacturing house about 30 minutes from us in terms of the boards and then we bring those inside the factory for final integration and test at our stuff. So as we, we've grown with that, we've of course K3, KP500 amplifiers and so on. Then the smaller radios, we can next generation of the portable radios, we did the 
KX3, which just exploded. We just shipped thousands of those in the first couple of months and continue to do very well to this day with the KX3, which is a portable, all-mode HF radio. And it's about you can hold in your hand. And this is something that you've applied across the range of Elecraft radios, that you can get that satisfaction of putting a radio together yourself. You can do it with the K3S now, the later version of the K3, the KX3, uh, KPA 500, 500 watt amplifier. Uh, the KX2 is a little too dense, a little tiny version of the KX3 for like soda mountain topping, things like that. So that one's factory assembled. Our larger amplifier, the KPA 1500, is factory assembled just because of the complexity of the mechanical design to get rid of all that heat outside effectively. Um, the K4, when we talk about that, that one is available initially as a factory assembled. This is sort of how we always introduce. And as we watch how we build it in the factory, we rewrite the kit manual, and then there'll be a modular kit version of it a few months after that. And that brings us nicely to the K4. So Eric, tell us about Elecraft's new baby. Yeah, it definitely is our new baby here. Um, the K4 is a direct sampling, um, directly into the analog digital converter at RF, uh, SDR transceiver. It uh, runs a 16-bit A to D, high dynamic range, uh, part very good linearity, that 122.8 megahertz sampling, and that can cover from 160 through six meters direct sampling in the radio. Um, we've got, a, of course, a new graphic uh, display and interface, built-in pan adapter, as you can see here. Um, a whole new UI. One thing we try to do with this radio is also give you both a touch screen experience if you want it for tuning the radio. You can jump around like that or you can see this on the display in the back here too. Um, but also um, physical buttons so you don't have to use the touch screen for most common functions and so you can use them either way if you want. Do you have to work your way through then different levels of menus to get to the controls you want? Um, you may have one button to bring up a band, set of band buttons or something like this where you can basically uh, you know, pick 40 meters or 20 meters and something like that. But in terms of multi-levels, trying to find that magic button you have to push to turn something on, that's not even existing in this, this implementation because we have a nice screen, we can put everything right in front of you. When we bring up a menu on it, for instance, we can scroll through a whole bunch of menu items on the screen at once. Our older radios, you had one line because that's all we had on the, the single displays. So that would, you tend to get lost a little more easily. Whereas here, if you're setting up the radio one time, you can actually quickly go to the transmit functions. Oh, that's the one I want. Bang, and you're done. That's going to make it a lot easier for the de-expedition or the contester or just making sure that that rare DX doesn't escape. Exactly. And we want to have all that at the top level. So while you have the most commonly used controls that you're going to be using in, a, say, a de-expedition or chasing DX, are actually also physical buttons here. So you've got all of your uh, VFO control buttons here, A to B, copy A to B, you know, switch back and forth, um, auto spot, but also um, all of your uh, noise blanking, noise reduction, preamplifier, those are physical keys that you can press on and off. Yes, you can touch some of those on the screen and change them, but we also want to give you the physical keys with a nice sharp click. We actually changed the uh, physical dynamic on this to a uh, mechanical button behind these, uh, these rubber buttons here, but these are also very hard durometer rubbers, so it's firm, it doesn't... And you get a good positive action. A positive on action, actually, you feel the click in your hand when you're pressing yeah. it there. They like that, we do like yeah. that. Can you plug the big screen straight into the radio? Yes, we basically go directly into a, like an HDMI monitor off the back of the radio, and that gives you whatever the resolution of that monitor is. The internal computer automatically senses the resolution of the monitor and adjusts to that. Um, example is I've taken, also by the way, it's an independent monitor from the main screen. It's not a copy of the whole screen. I could do that, but we chose, in many cases, you don't want to have the screen cluttered up with extra buttons that really, besides just showing you, you could adjust those over here on the main screen, it would make just take up space. So here what we've done, and for instance, I've taken just the pan adapter here and shown it on, on this screen large format. But there's less dots on this screen across than this one, by a factor of two at least. And so we actually do a higher resolution uh, calculation on the spectrum display, and that gives you a high res display on the screen. So it's much easier on the eyes to look at, and you can see a lot more detail. And it makes a much more point of having the big screen. Oh, absolutely. Really. No, it, give, it gives you that nice, of course, nice for shows like this. To, and I can't help noticing, Eric, you've got a tablet here that's displaying the screen as well. How, how's that happening? Well, what we're doing here is showing off the remote control capability of the K4. Um, the K4 has a Ethernet connection out the back of the radio that can have both streaming audio, remote control of the radio, a um, whole set of commands go back and forth over that. And for remote control, out of the box, by the way, we can control one K4 from another. And literally, I did that at Dayton uh, convention, where I actually had a second K4 plugged into the Ethernet. That's all it had plugged into it, right next to a K4 with the RF cable and everything else. They were running identical, because they were feeding, and one was controlling the other one at the same time. 
and you couldn't tell which one was the real radio and which one was just getting it over the network. What's nice there, of course it's an expensive remote control device, but that was a quick way to control it. That's already built into the software. So we can do, eventually we'll do a K40, which is the front panel by itself. You can take portable with you like our K30 on the K3, but also software applications. So back down on the, on the tablet here, um, that gives you the capability of um, actually, in the case showing it off here, is seeing what the spectrum looks like in real time over the network. I'm running actually wireless in here. And uh, it, this actually is showing uh, the same display that we're seeing on the screen. I'll reach over and twist the VFO, and then you'll, on that display, it'll be changing in real time. Um, I can even touch the screen and change the frequency. And I'm using the same user interface software that's running inside the K3. This is on a Windows uh, Surface tablet. Um, it's actually running in a Linux window under Surface on, win on Windows. Uh, so basically, it was a quick way for us to translate what we have on the screen on the radio over to here. And then we have a little internet connector program that connects us to the IP of the radio. But that allows you to get streaming audio. No extra external hardware. It's plug and play out of the box for remote control. Um, on radio, uh, tablets or desktops, we'll probably first version of software we would offer um, is something like a Windows-based software package, um, followed by, uh, we hope, either have us or other people write iOS and Android, things like that. But that one will have a wide base to start, and you can plug uh, through a little USB dongle, you can plug in a, a microphone and key and headphones, and away you go, uh, or speaker. And also, we have our, our K-Pod, the little external knob that we, uh, we make for uh, our radios. That plugs in over USB to this radio. So on your desktop, you can have a separate knob, say for VFOB, down on the desktop if you want, a full-size knob. Or on a tablet or laptop here, you can um, plug that into it so you have a real knob when you're operating portable with the software app. It really does seem that when you guys design something, you make sure that you include everything the operator's going to want. Well, there's always more. Our customers remind us of that. But uh, that's certainly part of it. But in the case of this, that those two will be, I mean, you'll see those early, and then you'll see the near the end of this next year, um, the K4 is zero, so you can take that with you to operate portable uh, Ethernet connection out the back or hook up a Wi-Fi dongle and you're on the air, so that'll be very nice. Have you had a good uh, positive reaction from the amateur community to the K4? We introduced it in May at Dayton, um, started taking orders in the U.S. then, and it's just overwhelmed us. We've, we've had a phenomenal amount of orders and interest in it. Um, it's been exciting for us, so it, uh, it's certainly given us a lot of validation that we did the right thing. And uh, the additional features that we had in the, have in the radio in terms of performance increasing, modular, you can add to the radio, um, and that flexibility to, to mo modify it and change it over time really helps people an awful lot. Eric, thank you very much for showing us Elacraft's new baby, the K4. It's been fantastic to see it, and also fantastic to meet the man behind it. Well, it's really good to meet, pleased you, to meet you. It's good talking to you. Quite an impressive story there from Eric Schwartz. Still to come on TX Factor, details of our latest free to enter draw and a trip to the English South Coast to meet the guys who are providing assistance to link up two city councils using 5 GHz RF links. The Radio Society of Great Britain is proud to be a sponsor of TX Factor. The RSGB exists to protect, promote and enhance the use, understanding and enjoyment of wireless communication. It's always represented radio amateurs at national and international level and strengthening this representation is part of its strategic goals. Nationally, the RSGB works with Ofcom to maintain radio amateurs' access to the spectrum, gain access to additional parts of the spectrum for innovation and experimentation, and it addresses issues of noise and interference, such as VDSL. Internationally, as the UK's national society, the RSGB is part of the International Amateur Radio Union, the IARU Region 1, which covers Europe, Africa and the Middle East. The Society sends teams of expert volunteers to the high-profile IARU and World Radio Conference meetings. They contribute high levels of skill and competence to the important technical discussions and influence the decisions taken there. These discussions affect a wide range of issues, including spectrum use in the future, interference, and the future of amateur radio and the views of young radio amateurs. The IARU states that national societies across the world need to work together for the good of amateur radio internationally. The RSGB would encourage all radio amateurs to join their national society to give a stronger voice through the IARU.
Right then, here's what we have to offer in this episode's Free to Enter Draw. From our sponsor, the RSGB, we have two books, both ideal for the long winter nights ahead. The Call Seeker Plus 2020 and the ever useful RSGB yearbook. And from our other sponsor, Martin Lynch, we have a great stocking filler, the Yesu FT25E 2 meter monoband handy. The entire bundle can be yours if your entry is first out of the shack hat. Full details of how to enter and terms and conditions are on our website. So, best of luck! It's fantastic to visit somebody in an office who hasn't got the usual clutter they have on their desk. They've got an entire ham radio station and then some. So we're talking to Tim Pettis, 2 Echo Zero Charlie X-Ray Quebec, who works here at Southampton City Council with this amazing desk full of amateur radio equipment. Tim, we'll get to why you've got a shack on your desk in a moment. But first of all, what's your job with the council? So I'm a Senior Emergency Preparedness Resilience and Response Officer. So is there an acronym for that? EPRR officer, Good. simple as that. Well, I'm really glad I didn't have to remember that and do it as an introduction for you. So what does the job actually involve, Tim? So we manage the contingency arrangements for both the authorities, actually here and in Portsmouth, we manage a joint team, uh, as well as three districts. So we, we do all the emergency preparedness arrangements for the councils, and then we work with multi-agency partners uh, when there is a significant event. So we have plans in place covering a whole range of risks, really. Now, this is a city with a lot going on, isn't it? Because, I mean, you've got the docks and Portsmouth as well. You've got the port there. Uh, you've got a big airport here. Absolutely. So there's quite a lot of contingencies to cover, I should Absolutely. Think. We're a very busy city, as is Portsmouth and the surrounding area. So things around transport, for example, um, adverse weather, uh, movement of people, so mass casualties, uh, the worst case scenario, mass fatalities. Things like pandemic influenza, so that's a national number one risk for this country, actually. Um, part of my role is public health, so what we need to have in play for anything such as a, a health incident as well. And I suppose there are other things that aren't an emergency as such, but involve a lot of coordination, a lot of communications that you and your department would get involved with. Yeah, so again, there may be an event overseas, for example, where we may need to repatriate people back into the United Kingdom, and it may not affect us in this area, but they may draw on our um, assistance with perhaps some facilities or personnel. So it can be absolutely anything uh, in emergencies uh, that gets us involved, really. And other things like President Trump visiting Pompey. Yes, well, th again, the national arrangements or uh, commemoration for D-Day took place in Portsmouth, as you just mentioned, and we had 16 uh, heads of state uh, come to the city, along with uh, President Trump and Her Majesty the Queen, and that required a coordination of multi-agency partners. We operated our control facilities. For example, here, I managed the fallback location from this location, managing both cities normal emergencies whilst the event was taking place. And that's the kind of event where the whole reputation of the country is at stake. You've got heads of state from around the world. Uh, you've got a lot of members of the public there as well. The coordination and the communication is very important. So what would happen if the communication system failed? Well, this is a reason why we've put in play uh, arrangements to, to mitigate that. So uh, being an amateur radio operator, this seemed an ideal opportunity to bring in um, uh, our amateur radio community to support in an emergency. So, Did you have to sell that idea to the City Council at all? Say, look, you know, I'm a ham radio operator. We can bring this expertise in to help because our yeah. communication still works when the other stuff doesn't. Well, again, luckily, I mean, I was involved with London 2012 in Dorset. Uh, so uh, worked for the Cabinet Office at the time. And my re remit was to make sure that arrangements were in place. So we had a resilient set of games in Dorset. Part of that was around secure comms, and I had the opportunity to work with Dorset Raynet and others to put in arrangements to link up critical infrastructure. And, and I brought that idea with me when I came here. So many years later, I end up in Southampton, uh, absolutely pushing against an open door about putting in uh, resilient arrangements. And this has developed over three years from nothing to now what you see behind me on my, uh, my place of work. It used to be that there was a lot more amateur radio involvement in emergency planning. Has that been slipping away in recent yeah, years? Yes, so there, it's not as good as it used to be. Uh, local authorities do communicate uh, with organisations like Raynet. Um, some are very, uh, uh, very good at 
uh, having those maintaining those links and um, others an, have let it drift. Um, there is work going on. I'm doing some work at the moment with the Department of Health about how we can increase the critical infrastructure around comms through amateur radio linking to major hospitals, for example. And um, so the work that we've done around the repeaters here in the south, certainly Portsmouth and Southampton, where that's been publicised, I've now had an interest worldwide from emergency planners about how we could best link up uh, critical uh, sites through amateur radio. The problem is, I suppose, Tim, that a lot of people don't realise just how fragile the internet is, really, and, and the power supply system. Yeah, so, yeah, we live in a society where we re rely on this all the time, but it is quite a fragile infrastructure. Uh, so what we've done is uh, we've supported, as an emergency planning team, uh, the uh, installation of the repeaters both in Southampton and Portsmouth. And of course, under the Civil Contingencies Act, there's actually a requirement where, as a Category 1 responder, so that's us as, us as councils and the emergency services, can actually look to the amateur radio community to support us in a crisis. And by using that um, opportunity, we've been able to get full buy-in and then uh, allow these uh, groups to install their repeaters. So that's great. You've got a repeater in Portsmouth, you've got a repeater in Southampton. Yep. Uh, those can be used and you can get Raynet and other amateurs to come in and help use that for communications in an emergency. But what if whatever's damaged the rest of the infrastructure takes your repeaters out as well? Yes, and again, this is where uh, the both groups uh, in Southampton and Portsmouth have done some very clever work about linking through non-internet connecting. Um, so there's an opportunity for the repeaters hopefully to work. If one fails, the other one will still, still work. And so from this office, I can speak to Portsmouth quite happily, either through the link or directly, actually, because of the, li of the location we're at. Uh, in terms of uh, infrastructure around power, um, we're quite lucky here. The site is, we have a generator and we generate our own electricity through um, solar panels. We've actually got 96 hours worth of generating power uh, within the facility if we lost power externally. So you're pretty well prepared, yep. and that's evidenced, of course, by that big pile of radio equipment you've got in the corner of your desk there. So what have you got there and what does it do? Yes, so um, if we start at the bottom, I've got Marine VHF radio. Um, this has got um, Channel Zero programmed in because the facility as a whole becomes a tactical command centre, so multi-agency partners would attend here. This allows the Coast Guard to speak back to their control room. Obviously the building infrastructure wouldn't allow that on a hand portable. Then we've then got a, an analogue uh, amateur radio that's a quad band. Uh, and again, this is programmed up uh, for the repeaters in this area as well as uh, the Raynet frequencies. Uh, and again, if there was an, a, an instant where we required a multi-agency response, Raynet would come and sit here and operate from this desk. Then we've got a fusion radio here so we can speak to the digital network uh, that's obviously now in play. Am uh, airwave radio to speak to the emergency services. This has uh, all the talk groups nationally. Uh, so I can speak to any emergency service control room. I can also speak to emergency services at the on the ground. Once I know which talk group they're in, I can speak to them directly from this office. Uh, we've got citizen ban radio. Uh, people may find that unusual, but the reason for that is we're adjacent to the port and we have a thousand lorry vehicle movements a day into the docks alone. Lots of those lorry drivers use CB and we can talk to them about issues on the road network. Uh, they, we then have our own Southampton City digital uh, radio network for our, our own internal use uh, where we can speak to parking, highways and also CCTV. Well, I've got to say, Tim, in the best sense of the word, that is the most radioactive office desk <laughs> I've ever seen. Thank you very much. <laughs> so Tim's got all the kit here, but as we've heard, a very important part of this in terms of emergency communication is those two repeaters. One in Southampton, the other is in Portsmouth, and that's where Mike Marsh is waiting to find out from the guys behind it how they've managed to make their repeaters resilient in the face of disaster. Yeah, welcome to Portsmouth. It's a little bit different than Bob's experience at Comms HQ, warm and nice and dry. Right out here, we're in the big wild, wet outdoors, and because we're radio hams, we soak up whatever's thrown at us. In Portsmouth right now, I'm with, with Wes and Mark, who are here to tell us all about the repeater system on this tower block. Now, which repeater are we at here, Wes? This is GB7PO. Okay. 
Uh, this is the, the Fusion repeater, which is linked down to GB7MT down in Southampton on top of Sarah Robinson House in uh, Portsmouth. And why did you choose to link both of these repeaters together? That originally came from a requirement from uh, Tim down at Southampton Council that he needed to link the two councils together because Tim is in charge of emergency planning between Portsmouth City Council and also Southampton City Council. So, and also digital made this link a little bit more secure to avoid casual eavesdroppers. And you know, I guess it makes sense as well because linking the two cities together gives a wider coverage for everything. It does. As, as a general amateur radio repeater, we've got coverage now from Swanage down in Dorset right down to Arundel wow, okay. in, in West Sussex okay. and most of the Isle of Wight. And why did you choose Fusion, for example, as your kind of grounding for this link? Why not something else? Well, we've already got uh, a DMR stroke D-Star repeater in the area, a couple of D-Star repeaters in the area, but there was no Fusion in the area. So I was talking to Carl down at Yesu, he was interested to get Fusion repeaters going in the area. Yeah, and there is something really reliable about Fusion, the audio is great. Audio quality is great and it just works. It works out of the box. There's very little configuration to do. Anyone can set up their radios, set your call sign and the radio works. Did you find with this installation it was kind of pretty much like plug and play? Pretty much was, yes. Yeah, pretty plug and, plug and play. Okay. All right. Well, Mark's here as well and you're going to talk to me about the antenna that yeah. you've got linked across. Can we take a look at that? Yeah, sure. You've got the big AC 620 mil dish, which is the link that's doing the roughly about 13 miles over to um, GB7 MT. Uh, the dish above that is actually going back to Wesley's house, where we actually monitor the link 24 hours a day for absolutely everything, whether the system is going to be going online, offline, the power levels, the RF receive levels, everything really. And then the dish above that is actually booming over to my house uh, in Fairham, so we've got a double hop link. So if we so you can actually remotely control yes. the setup on the tower block. Yeah, from two locations. From home. Yes. Fantastic. So that's really just in case Wes's link goes down, we've still got access over to here to um, we can close down the repeater, we can shut the link down. There's quite a number of uh, options that we actually can do. Would you ever need to do that for any reason? Actually, shut it down? Uh, well, if we ever get any interference from anywhere, obviously we're a couple of hundred yards away from the dockyard or anything like yeah. that, uh, we can just literally log on and flick a switch and actually power down the whole, the whole repeater, but we can actually leave the links live still. Is the link that you've got running between the two repeaters open for everybody to use? Obviously no, just it's not. Okay. Well, the link is locked, um, that's called a point-to-point -point link. Okay. Um, so that's all 128-bit encrypted. It could actually be 256, I really can't remember now. Um, but obviously, outside of that link, anyone who's got an amateur license obviously can use the Fusion system. Okay. And do you have a lot of uh, a lot of stations using it? Is it very active in this area? I would say probably on a Sunday evening is probably the most busiest. Um, we've had up to, about, I think it's about 42 people on for about a two and a half hour net. So, um, yeah, it's not so busy during the week, but a Sunday evening, it's normally pretty, uh, it's normally pretty crowded. Yeah. Now, because this is digital yeah. and all things plug in, one of the things that, that interests me is why did you choose not to actually use the internet to connect the two repeaters together and do it by a radio? Right, OK. The reasons of that is because Portsmouth City Council, Southampton City Council actually wanted a link that works in an emergency situation. Um, so if the internet goes down, the BT telephone exchange, anything that would interrupt comms, um, this will just carry on running purely by itself over the Wi-Fi point-to-point -point link with no issues at all. Yeah, um, so that completely gets around power cut issues. Yes, everything. Um, we've got two big batteries down there that will actually support the whole system for roughly about four weeks. Um, but if the repeater is being used, constantly it's probably about seven days. I think everybody would agree that this is pretty fantastic actually that an amateur based system has been set up for the wider community to use and you're providing a great backup service for maybe emergency services you know imagine if the the police and the ambulance and the fire systems go down yeah they'll call on you and you can call they them up indeed. and it's gonna work come rain or shine, shine. and ah <laughs> oh. I think that about says it all, really. 
So what you guys have set up here is kind of pretty groundbreaking. How about other members of our community getting involved, doing the same thing as you guys? Are you up for that? Most definitely, yeah. We, we will certainly be happy to talk to other repeater groups that want to know how we've done it and want some, some assistance. Maybe learn a bit from what we've got, what, what we've shown today. Well, for, for, from what we understand, you have had quite a lot of uh, calls regarding the, the linking. They've had other repeater groups showed an interest already, so uh, I think it is going to be moving forward. Seems to me to be a no-brainer, really, it to does. link repeaters across the country, you know, for like country-wide. Independent of the public network. Absolutely, yeah. So from the 20th floor with Portsmouth's famous Spinnaker Tower peeping over the parapet and the rain pouring down, it's high time I made my way to Southampton. Guys, do you reckon we can do that by microwave link? I'm sure we can. Come on, press the button, let's get out of here. So here we are back in Southampton now. I left Portsmouth because it was cold, it was wet, it was damp and it was foggy. And they told me it was going to be so much better when I got here. Ah, oh, not quite. But what's not to like when you can climb to the top of a tower block at 103 storeys high and come and play antennas. Phil is with me here now and he's part of the family of the repeaters that are linked together. And you're going to tell me all about the Fusion repeater we've got on the tower block right here. So Mike, this is GB7MT. It's a Yaesu Fusion repeater. However, we're only operating it in the digital mode. Um, and because it's 70 cents, it's quite quiet really. So to try and stimulate act Activity, what we decided to do was to link it to the, ports, the um, GB7PO in Portsmouth um, and the way we've done that, although we could have easily done that with the internet, because of our hands, we thought we need to do this via radio. So what, so what we've done, we've used off the shelf 5 gigs uh, linking equipment um, to actually provide that, that link. It's a 13 mile hop um, and we've got so much bandwidth we don't know what to do with it. It's absolutely crazy. And literally was off the shelf equipment. Literally, you can buy these things. You don't need a license, strangely enough. Um, if, if, if you use them in their off the shelf mode, um, I think it runs about a watt. You can buy a, com a commercial license, which will give you, I think, up to four watts. And also, you can actually run these in the amateur bands, which opens up even more doors. So I'm loving all this off the shelf malarkey, but what about the antenna that you're using for the 5 gigs link? Believe it or not, it's that little dish behind us there. That's all we've got. We've, we've got the same both ends um, and that's all, all we did. So did you guys like have to be line of sight with each other and, and, and kind of focus in to get the antennas lined up perfectly? We were really worried about that and believe it or not, these things literally worked out of the box. We literally roughly pointed them to where we thought they, they should go and we had a respectable signal right from the word go. Yes, we had to fine tune it, but um, it was a lot easier than we thought it would be. That's perfect amateur radio, isn't it? It is, that's how it should be all the time, isn't it? Yeah, and how much, how much power are you running from dish to dish, let's say, for the link? We're running four watts because we've actually got a license that covers us for that. Um, if you buy the thing off the shelf, I believe it, it, you can only legally use a watt, which will still get you a fairly decent distance. Yeah, and, and 4 watts is giving you a really good strong link across... We've got 120 meg link, of which we're using 30k. So we've got 99 point, I don't know how many percent redundancy. And what happens, like, it's not brilliant weather today, but what happens, let's say, if the weather turns wintry and we get lots of snow, because that's going to knock you for six, so to Well, speak. we've started to test that, and to, to be honest, we can actually put things in front of the dish um, and still get a reasonable link. So we're, we're, we're quite confident that even the worst rainstorm or the worst snow, snowstorm, this is going to sail through it. It's going to actually sail through it. So you know what? I'm loving this. In hellfire, brimstone and natural disaster, amateur radio still cut through and delivers. How long did it take you to set up all of this gear here and get it to work like first time? If you include all the paperwork and the uh, licensing and stuff like that, probably a couple of years. So once we had the kit, um, literally we tested it for a month um, and bang, it was on the air. Okay, and it's been working ever since? Fingers crossed. Faultlessly? Yes. Uh, we had one minor fault, okay. uh, which we fixed in four, in four hours, I think, wow. which turned out to be a commercially made end plug, which was faulty. So we used an amateur made one, which is now fine. <laughs> I love that. Just goes to show if you want a job done, do it yourself. Absolutely. 
Well, that just about wraps it up for our 25th episode of TX Factor. We'll be back in the new year with more features and news from the world of amateur radio. Do send us an email and let us know what you think of the programmes. It's always good to hear your thoughts and comments. Full show notes and all our past episodes are available on our website. So until the next time, from the whole team, Happy New Year and 7-3. TX Factor is brought to you in association with Martin Lynch & Sons, the world's favourite ham store. And the Radio Society of Great Britain is proud to sponsor TX Factor.